Hi, and welcome to Not My Generation, the political podcast that looks at political news and events through a generational lens. I am Professor James Davenport. This is my colleague, Dr. Emily Stacy, uh, And we've got uh, a few things we're going to be running through uh, today. We're going to talk about uh, the state reopening. Phase one begins tomorrow on May 1st. Uh, and then uh, we've also got some political news as far as an investigation of a state agency. Uh, and we're going to round up with some uh, interesting news on the presidential campaign front. So lots going on today. How are you doing today? I'm okay. How about you? I am doing well. I am I'm enjoying life I so think far, we, as we, much as possible. Right. I think we need to find some sort of uh, phrase to describe the psychology of this time. I feel very R quarantine fatigued. Uh, yes, um, right. It's It's very... Um, exhausted from doing nothing, <laughs> um, or, or trying to work, trying to, you know, I'm trying right. to write a new book, and right. you of course are dissertating, etc. But I just feel very um, hard pressed to be motivated these days. Yeah, so it can I, be I'm a hoping. struggle, right? You, you've <laughs> got to find uh, some things to, offer. I think that's a good advice for everyone is to find ways right. of uh, uh, sustaining your mental health, during yeah. the, not just your physical health, but Absolutely. your mental health as well. Uh, and uh, people do that in different ways, but it is an important thing. And, and, and being shut in some yeah. can really wear on people after well, a while. This certainly helps me. And yeah. The weather change is, is <laughs> helping as well. So. Well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the state is going to uh, open up. Phase one uh, begins on May 1st, tomorrow. Uh, and a few uh, types of businesses will be allowed to reopen uh, following uh, some kind of strict guidelines as far as uh, sanitation requirements uh, and and social distancing requirements, these types of things. Uh, so, uh, and, and everybody's kind of bracing, what is this going to mean? What's right. this going to look like? How's it going to feel? And so, uh, as we as we get into that, uh, I wanted to mention Pat McFerrin, who is a uh, public opinion researcher here in Oklahoma. He's kind of a data guy, has been tracking for a while now kind of a running seven-day totals of mm -hmm. cases in, in the state, all right? Uh, and um, yesterday, this is the last day update that I have, uh, there were 579 uh, cases on that day, mm -hmm. um, which is the lowest that we've seen since April 1st, uh, and it was the first time also since April 1st that that number had been below 600. So okay. at least the trend line is going, and, and, and the trend line has been declining, obviously not in a straight line, but okay. uh, it's been declining uh, since about April 6th or, or 7th, sometime around in there. Uh, so that's good news in Absolutely. the sense that, that we're getting the right trend line. Now, will that change right. when uh, we start uh, reopening things? That's the big question, right. what everybody's concerned about. Um, and part of that deals with how aggressively people get back out, how, sure. how much people go in and they try to, to act like things are back to normal. Right. On that point, uh, Sooner Poll, uh, ran by uh, Bill Shepard, um, did a survey of Oklahomans mm -hmm. and released the results uh, yesterday uh, on how Oklahomans are going to be looking at reopening, right? Okay. And so uh, one of the questions was, uh, when these restrictions are lifted and you can go back into these places mm -hmm. and whatnot, you know, how aggressively are you going to do that? And so uh, about 21% said, I'm going to get out there and, and act just like I did before the pandemic, right? So one in five said, okay. I'm going to get out there and live my life normally. Mm -hmm. uh, another 18% said, I'm going to do the things that I did before, but I'm probably going to wear a mask or other mm -hmm. protective gear, right? Okay. And so they're going to be a little bit more cautious. Sure. 49% said, I'm still going to be getting out less than, uh, than what I did before that until there's a vaccine or other medicines to, to deal with the virus. Um, another almost 5% said, I'm not getting out at all, right? I'm going to stay hunkered sure. down, right? Sure. Uh, so, so some interesting takes. So it doesn't look like Oklahomans, uh, at least uh, b based on the results from this poll, are just going to be a mass mob of people rushing back out and sure. resuming life, trying to resume life as normal. Sure. I have some national numbers that actually mirror that as well. There Excellent. was an NPR Marist poll uh, that was reported yesterday. Um, so the gist of this question is, without further testing, is it a good idea or a bad idea 
to um, return to work. So 32% uh, of people polled said it was a good idea without okay. further testing. 65% said it was a bad idea to return to work. Okay. Uh, Dine-in restaurants, 80% said it was a bad idea without uh, testing, further testing. Uh, 85% reopening schools mm -hmm. uh, said it was a bad idea, which is something that your politicians are kind of floating as. Right, we've seen of some of that. Mm -hmm. experimentation. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, situation and then a whopping 91 percent right um, said it was a bad idea to attend large sporting events uh -huh. um, so mm -hmm. that is definitely not uh, a statistic that's going to bode well as we move through uh, the very coveted or towards the very coveted college football right. season exactly uh, right in the state of and, Oklahoma and, and we've heard discussions at both at the professional sports level and at college sports yeah. about how are they going to deal right. with this right and so that might indicate that uh, if they do hold the games and they allow the public, there's not going to be just a lot of people right. showing up, right? I, I at think, least at this point Yeah, in time. I think you've got to limit uh, the tickets where you were seeing thousands of fans. You're going to see hundreds, maybe even in the tens. So here's an interesting thing. You had mentioned kind of the wearing of kind of being locked in and, sure. and, and, and stay at home uh, type of situation mm -hmm. for a while. So one of the questions that, that uh, Sooner Poll asked was, how would you describe the time that you've had at home mm -hmm. during this pandemic, either by yourself or with your family, sure. right? Uh, and 60%, a little over 60% yeah. said that they found it either somewhat enjoyable or very enjoyable, awesome. right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, people are yeah. kind of relaxing, I guess, a little bit. And, I'm and, so glad somebody, somebody knows Somebody how is, right? To relax. Because that That's does nice. not describe me, right? I am chafing yeah, I to... To, to I complain a lot, but it is a very lovely time that I get to spend with my one-year-old. Yes, so, right. You know, those are moments that you're not going to get back in. So it's it's good to have that dedicated time. But it's been uh, definitely a, a challenge for somebody who likes to be in front of students, who mm -hmm. likes to be out and about and, you know, in the must and fuss of the politics. Right, sir. exactly. That's what we like That's to what do. we do. That's yeah. right. Uh, there's a reason we're in the social sciences, <laughs> That's right? right? Exactly. Uh, only about 20, 21 percent said that it was either uh, somewhat stressful or very stressful That's for them. Good. So uh, people seem to be uh, accommodating themselves yeah. to this environment yeah. relatively well, right? Uh, again, for and 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 I would say this uh, on on the Marist survey mm -hmm. too. Uh, I bet your perspective changes based on how much your location has been hit by this sure. virus, right? right. Uh, yeah. In those states, if you're in Certainly. New York or even in Seattle, mm -hmm. some places like that, where you've taken this huge hit from right. the virus, I'm sure you're going to be way more cautious than, say, people like in Oklahoma yeah. or somewhere like that, Absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, one other question that, that I thought was interesting um, is uh, if they require, if the government officials require you, if you're out in public, to wear a mask mm -hmm. or other protective gear, what what will be your attitude toward that, right? right? Uh, and 59% uh, said that they would wear it with no problem. Not they mm -hmm. just they would just do it, and there would not be any any right. trouble for them to do it. Uh, another 21% said I will wear it, but I won't be happy about it, right? <laughs> so uh, almost uh, well, yeah, 80% said, look, we're gonna if, if yeah. the government says you should we, we should wear this, they're gonna wear it, right? Yeah. Uh, which, uh, again, I think goes to the point that both the Marist Survey and, and this one does is people are taking it seriously. Right. They believe that this is an issue uh, and they don't want to put themselves, expose themselves or other people at unnecessary risk. Right? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I did see a story, um, obviously local, um, earlier this week where I believe Guthrie, um, some citizens in Guthrie were uh, very unhappy about mm -hmm. uh, the, the mask and the social distancing and the, the uh, kind of shelter in place, stay at right. home, healthier at home uh, initiative. Uh, and were um, fighting back legally, uh, saying that their constitutional rights had been violated because of these orders. And so um, you do see those kind of pockets or those outliers um, in the data, but sure. uh, it, it does suggest uh, certainly um, that a majority of folks, uh, like you said, are taking it seriously. Anecdotally, I went to Super Target yesterday, yay, um, for the first time in a very long time, which is dangerous, of course. Um, <laughs> Super Target is addictive. Um, <laughs> and I think that looking at the public, just kind of, um, you know, if you got an aerial shot of who's wearing a mask, who's not kind of clustering, mm -hmm. um, who is social distancing, who's not, um, I, I think that the data is about right. You've got about 80, 75, 80% of people who are wearing a mask mm -hmm. if, if it's not, you know, correctly um, being worn. It sure. is on, you know, their ears um, and they're ready to, to put it up whenever they come into closer contact with people. 
people. And so, um, and then of course you just have those folks who are adamant and walking sure. around um, as if it were, you know, before the pandemic. And so um, it, it does seem like a majority of the population, at least uh, in this state, are trying to um, be responsible. Sure. And, and I see, you know, various things, uh, whether you're in, uh, if, you're, if you're stopping at the convenience store, mm -hmm. you know, you'll see, uh, I've seen more lately wearing masks than yeah, not wearing masks, uh, or uh, protective gloves, things yeah. like that as yeah. well. Uh, so I think people are going to, and again, you, you mentioned the folks up in Guthrie, I think you've got mm -hmm. uh, a little bit there, where again, a little bit further out from the metro area, uh, not quite as maybe hit by the number of cases and or the proportion of cases in their community sure. as, as maybe in the or metro area right well. and sure. so uh, uh and i think that's where you see a lot of this this yeah. uh resistance sure. is in those sure. kind of communities right uh well now shifting to uh, another to interesting topic uh not unrelated to uh the covid 19 situation is uh the attorney general's recent call for an investigation an audit if you will of the oklahoma state department of health and uh, and this was announced uh, a couple of days ago that uh, they, he wanted to look specifically at the spending done by the State Department of Health in relation to the COVID-19 situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and this did not make Governor Stitt very happy. Yeah. Uh, he's like, look, this agency is trying to deal, we're in the middle of dealing with this COVID-19 crisis. This isn't the best time to call for an investigative audit. Sure. Uh, and uh, apparently the uh, state auditor and inspector, Cindy Bird, so mm -hmm. uh, that's an independent office, right? And so they, she determines what they will do and what right. they won't. Uh, has, has said, yeah, we're going to we're going to conduct right. this audit, and so this is going to be interesting. It will be. Um, so you know viewer beware um, this is certainly not the first time that the osdh has oh, gone no. through um, a very serious audit the last round 2017 2018 uh, led to pretty major resignations of some career mm -hmm. uh, politicians um, at that agency and within the oklahoma health care sector um, so this is certainly not the first time and i i understand governor stitt's kind of hesitation uh, and certainly um, his concern about the timing uh, mm -hmm. of the audit, but if the attorney general, right, um, has deemed it necessary, it certainly seems as mm -hmm. if it is not um, maybe a spurious claim. Right, and and, uh, and I guess we'll find out, you know, what sure. what specifically they're looking for. Uh, the auditor and inspector's office has never been one that has been perceived as overtly political, right? Not. In, in the sense of they have a statutory and constitutional responsibility sure. to ensure that public funds are being spent in accordance with the law. Right. Uh, and uh, and I, since she's been in office, I haven't seen uh, Bird trying to use this no. the, her position in any political way. So yeah. I, I have some, some, uh, some confidence that the audit will be conducted appropriately and, right. uh, and thoroughly. Uh, and then we'll find out what, what the results are. Uh, but the State Department of Health is no stranger to controversy sure. or this kind of uh, uh, problems, as you mentioned, yeah. you had uh, the head, kind of the heads of the, the, the department uh, resigned after the last one. Yeah. And so uh, this is going to be uh, an interesting situation. I do get the feeling uh, that there is some tension, to put it sure. nicely, yeah. uh, regarding the State Department or the governor and the Within attorney the general. Cabinet, yeah. right? I, I, I don't feel that the, the governor and the attorney general are necessarily on the same page. Yeah. Uh, and there's some a, a little bit of conflict there. Have you, have you kind of seen that? Too? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. It would seem that A.G. Hunter is um, on a mission. I'm not sure that he has a, a personal vendetta, certainly, right. against OH, OSDH. Um, as, as you said, it's his responsibility to protect that protect uh, public funds. I, I, and again, I don't certainly mean to implicate that uh, or imply that Governor Stitt is, is trying to hide anything, right. um, but it, it seems like if you have nothing um, to worry about, then you allow the audit to, to go right, forward right. without any sort of um, any sort of political rhetoric, I right. think. And, and in his, his, his kind of reply, the governor did yeah. say that you know, they fully intend to comply. They feel yeah. like they have been rather transparent in this process so far. Right. Uh, and we'll see how all that plays out. Uh, uh, I'm sure for the folks who work at the State Department of Health, this probably isn't 
uh, what they wanted on top of already a very full plate. Right. Uh, but uh, hopefully, uh, we will we will see what what plays out, and and hopefully, uh, we'll see that. Uh, Things were spent appropriately, and listen, you can always get into a situation where you can question whether an agency should have spent something on this sure. or that, right? right. I mean, that, that's a policy question that we have all the time, right. uh, but that's different than saying they misspent or they spent broke the law in the way they spent right, that money. Exactly, right, exactly, or where they spent question. it. Right. Um, and so, you know, did they go through the competitive bidding process? Sure. Uh, was it um, purchased fairly, properly, et cetera? Um, and certainly with, within this case, I think the, the concern is um, that the company that they were, or the provider um, that they were purchasing the PPE from mm -hmm. are now under investigation by the federal government. Right. And so right. um, that definitely is going to raise some red flags and should. Um, with your attorney general's office. I, I think that is due diligence at sure. best. All right. Well, we've got one more topic to, to run through. Uh, we had uh, some activity uh, at the presidential campaign level. Uh, we have a new candidate who announced uh, that, that he is forming an explore. They always say this, an exploratory committee. Why don't you just say, hey, I'm running, All right? Uh, but an exploratory committee to run uh, as a libertarian. This is uh, U.S. Representative Justin Amash from uh, Michigan, right. uh, who was elected in 2010 as a Republican. Uh, in 2019, he switched to independent. Mm -hmm. uh, also, he was the lone Republican in the House to support the impeachment, impeachment. of yeah. Donald Trump. Right. Uh, and uh, and then announced uh, his switching again to the Libertarian Party, <laughs> and he's going to seek that party's nomination now. Uh, at this point, I don't think anybody's under any illusion that he's going to magically win. I mean, sure. it, the, the odds are heavily stacked against third-party candidates. Absolutely. But third-party candidates can pull votes, Absolutely. right? And can pull votes in, in tight states where you have a narrow difference between the yeah. two major party candidates. A third-party candidate that pulls a significant amount of votes can make a difference. They can. Yeah, certainly they can. And we saw that in 2016, where both of the uh, third party candidates, uh, Jill Stein uh, of the Green Party and Gary Johnson of the Libertarian Party, both uh, of their politics really mirrored more uh, of the Democratic candidate mm -hmm. rather than the Republican. And it really did um, hurt Hillary Clinton in the end, um, having certainly Gary Johnson's um, stance on medical marijuana. Sure. That is definitely right. going right. to pull from uh, the the liberal side of things, the democratic side of things, um, and that was really his only <laughs> his only talking point. Um, and so you you did have uh, the argument about certainly 2016 the spoiler vote. Um, you mm -hmm. can go back further to Ross Perot and HW. Right. right. Um, it, it's just it, it typically, unfortunately, because the, the lack of viability uh, for third parties in this country because of our entrenched two party system, sure. uh, the the best that they're able to do is really kind of hurt. play spoiler. Spoiler, yeah, right? In, in, in some way. And, and we've already seen both campaigns uh, kind of coming out with this. You see this every time there is a mm -hmm. third party candidate that may pull a significant number of votes. Right. Uh, a vote for this candidate is a vote for my opponent, right? right? Exactly. And so uh, so both the, the Trump and the, the Biden campaigns are already sending that message out. Uh, so apparently, if you vote for a mosh, not only are you voting for a mosh, but you're voting for Trump if you're a Biden <laughs> voter or you're voting right. for Biden. So that's three votes. That could get you in trouble. That's voter right. fraud if you vote three times, right? Oh, so dear. you never know. I'm, there's uh, a committee for this. One of the things that I'll mention, uh, that, that third-party candidates, and we saw this with the Johnson campaign, who yes. pressed and pressed, but to get legitimacy, you, the, the third-party candidates have to be seen on the same stage yes. with these two major Very party important. candidates, right? Uh, and the debate stage is really the only opportunity to do that. And in 2016, uh, uh, the Trump and Clinton campaign successfully prevented Johnson yeah. from being even on the stage Shut in any of the out. debates, yeah. right? Uh, and so that will be a, a question again going forward. Can Amash uh, put something together to, to make a case that he should be on that stage? Uh, I think it has been since Perot's 96 yeah. campaign, a, since we've had a third party candidate into the debates, right? Uh, and so uh, this will be very interesting. I can't help but think about the contrast were he to do it. So here sure. you have uh, the son of uh, Middle Eastern yes. immigrants to the United States, uh, younger, uh, 40-ish. Uh, uh, 39, in, in fact. Okay, yeah. and so uh, a younger candidate. Yes. 
uh, who uh, I think no one would question is probably a little bit more articulate than either of the other I, two. Yes, uh, and so that. that contrast could be very interesting. Now, again, debates do not win elections, sure. but just having a third party candidate on the same platform denotes some legitimacy to that third party yeah, candidate. Absolutely. Right? I, and, you know, they're offering alternatives, alternative ideology, alternative policies, mm -hmm. um, you know, that the, the other two parties are not uh, representing or giving to the people. I think he specifically is an interesting candidate choice um, in terms of the Libertarian Party. You kind of laid out his story very well, very advantageously, um, <laughs> voting for impeachment, switching uh -huh. parties, switching parties again, etc. I wonder, because you're the resident libertarian, um, he was actually, as you noted, he rode to the White, uh, I'm sorry, to uh, Capitol Hill on the uh, Tea Party. Wave, That's right. right. That's exactly um, right. He was one of the founders of the Freedom Caucus mm -hmm. um, at the Capitol. And so he really began his political career as an obstructionist, at best, uh, Republican, sure. right? Uh, working against President Obama's agenda at the time, um, and now is going to try to pull from that squishy middle sure, uh, right. of independence um, as a libertarian. I wonder how how that works into um, the, this 2020 presidential. Right. And I think, you know, what will be interesting is uh, how he positions himself. We know, at least from his record, mm -hmm. uh, he's a pro-life candidate. Sure. So uh, Republicans who right. uh, might be inclined to, to say, you know, I'd really like to cast a vote for someone other than Trump, but mm -hmm. I'm not really excited about Biden, sure. uh, might be enticed in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a little bit uh, more re restrictive on immigration than, say, the traditional libertarian uh, per position. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, too, might pull from Republicans sure. as well. Uh, on the same hand, you know, he's probably going to be pulling from some Biden voters in things like mer medical marijuana, okay. some issues like that, yeah. uh, uh, U.S. foreign policy. So it is really going to be interesting to see where his, his, his base, and again, remember Johnson, uh, who was the most successful third party candidate since Perot, only got about 5% of the the national vote right the foreign policy person it terrifies me <laughs> that he was, he was a successful third party uh, candidate not knowing what Aleppo was in the middle of the Syrian civil uh, war and I, um, I I think I saw someone tweet to uh, to Amash when he announced his his, his exploratory uh, committee that uh, the first question I have is you is what is Aleppo right they want to get that out uh, 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 so. Uh, but uh, but Amash is not someone who is not a uh, lack seriousness. Exactly. He, yeah. he, he's he, uh, he's, he's on viable. on top. He's a, a sitting member of Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like uh, he's been out of, of any of these policy disputes sure. or debates for a while. Uh, he has been shown himself willing to confront uh, his own party mm -hmm. uh, at the time when he was a Republican. Sure. Uh, and so I think it's going to be interesting again. Uh, third parties, you know, they lack the organization that mm -hmm. the two major parties Funding. have. They lack the fundraising yeah. uh, capability. This is all going to be uh, very difficult for him. But he does start with a little bit better place than most third party yeah. candidates. I'll have. agree. And he's going to have to if he's going to start on April 30th. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. All right. That wraps up today's show. We appreciate you guys being here with us, uh, and we'll keep you up to breast on all the interesting uh, information and stuff going on. Uh, and we will be back here next week.